Yeah, I think I make it uh, 6.45, team. Oh, wow, how lovely to see you all. Um, okay, so just before we kick off, I thought we, it would be really good to uh, give you the feedback on the Mentimeter. Um, we have two terrified participants. We have 10 overwhelmed. We have 18 fine, six energized, and 16 optimistic. So um, thank you all for taking part in that. Uh, absolutely fantastic. Um, my name is Sally Hurd and I'm SSE Director based in Cornwall. And um, I want to extend a huge welcome um, to our School for Social Entrepreneurs first online networking event. It's so good to uh, have you all here. A particular welcome to our social partners joining us this evening and our SSE teams who join us from all corners of our international network. Welcome. The biggest welcome of all, of course, is to you, our fellows, the people that drive us every day to learn more, support more, collectively be the best we can possibly be. It's so good to have you all with us to enjoy this evening of what will be a thought provoking and lively conversation. 2020 has been a tough year for us all. But you know, here we are, still wanting to come together to connect, to learn and do whatever it takes to grasp this terrifying opportunity for extraordinary change. This evening's interactive event is designed for you as SSE Fellows to come together for some much needed collective nurturing and some great inspiration to encourage us all to collaborate and continue our great work. In a moment, I will introduce you to the exceptional Amanda Brookman. But before I do that, I want to tell you that at the moment, to date, somebody might want to update me, in just a few moments ago, where there were 55 of us on this call. 55 of us joining this evening. You will appreciate that behind the scenes, we have a great team making all this happen virtually. So a huge acknowledgement to them and I think it is pretty helpful to keep in mind, particularly as social entrepreneurs, that we all know glitches are normal. So stick with us, we're gonna make this work. Um, okay, so I now want to move on to introducing our special guest for this evening, Manda Brookman, activist, social entrepreneur, and Extinction Rebellion member. Manda, and I go back many years and one of the most charismatic and brilliantly informed people I know. She unashamedly wears her passion on her sleeve and articulates it in a way most of us can only dream of. Based here in beautiful Cornwall, Manda, like many of you, has cut her teeth the hard way through lived experience encouraging, cajoling, and in some cases demanding new ideas are given an opportunity to flourish, to create change and do things differently. Through her work, and indeed the way she intentionally lives her life, Manda has become the go-to person in Cornwall, the UK and beyond for all things permaculture, all things planet tourism, all things sanctuary, and all things disruptive. Manda is a true thought leader and I find, I find her mind bogglingly inspirational. I very much hope you do too. A very warm welcome to Manda Brookman. Well, thank you very much indeed. Um, having, I didn't know you were going to introduce me like that, Sally. So having said that, I really hope everybody else does as well now. <laughs> Um, fantastic, just utterly brilliant to see um, screen after screen after screen of um, social entrepreneurs. This is my tribe. So it's a real privilege to be here with you today and all over the place with fantastic names. Um, I've been looking at the names that you've been giving to your businesses and my God, we are a creative bunch, I have to say. 
Um, right, I'm going to share some slides with you to talk about some of the things that um, Sally's been mentioning. Thank you very much for having me along tonight. I think it is about demanding change, actually, just to go back to um, that particular point that uh, Sally made. Let me know when, if somebody can nod when you can see my screen, that would be fantastic. Brilliant. Okay, right. I'm going to rattle through some of these things about 20 minutes because we want to make sure we've got an opportunity to chat um, but I want to talk to you about this notion of it being a terrifying opportunity for extraordinary change. Um, things are really odd at the moment and that is exactly the time that we need in order to make sure that the right change happens. So I'm going to talk a little bit about being in 2020 and a little bit about being a social entrepreneur. I run a series of programs underneath my social enterprise and I've been doing it for about 30 years um, and I know the brilliant stuff and I know the tricky stuff. Um, all of these things that I do, I find completely connected because as you guys will all know, um, we do tend to think in systems and in a joined up way. So I look at um, sustainable tourism and whether or not that is sustainable. And I've been running a network for a number of years with a number of different organizations. I work in permaculture, um, as Sally says, which is really about planetary and human health, making sure we bring it all together. Um, under the name of Permanently Brilliant. Um, and I run a network that looks at those big disruptive ideas and particularly looks at the psychology of change and what is it about those really big disruptive ideas that make it difficult for us generally as a species to engage with them. And I've discovered that quite a few people that are able to engage with those are people who don't think in straight lines. And I'm looking straight at the 50 odd people on this call tonight as co not straight line fingers. Okay, very quickly, the problems we have at the moment are multiple. We're seeing massive change at the moment. The source of change that we're seeing in the lifetimes now is much, much more than it was, say, 100 years ago. It's been referred to as VUCA, volatile, uncertain, complex and ambiguous, all of which makes even getting up in the morning and making a cup of tea complicated. In terms of running a business, it makes it sometimes like you're on some sort of um, dark roller coaster strapped in. And there are people still coming in. Um, Helen, I'm going to let you admit them. Brilliant. So we've got, we're in a very, very volatile time. It was already difficult enough to run a business. It has always been. It's particularly difficult to run a social enterprise when we are going up against the grain of what a business, a standard business is seen. And then, of course, we had COVID, which meant suddenly the very thing that we were trying to do, which was have impact and think about how we can move forward, was literally pulled out from underneath our feet. So it has been extremely challenging financially, it's also been extremely challenging in terms of our well-being. Well-being as citizens, definitely well-being as social entrepreneurs, having to find ways of doing what we were trying to do. And I know I've been there, I've sat on the carpet and wept during the financial crisis, which was the last big upheaval, when contracts that were guaranteed, when money that was written down on paper that was coming to you as payment for work already done suddenly was taken away from you when we're getting letters from the government saying everything's changed, we've spoken to our lawyers, we're going to change our minds and renege on payments. And it's not just what your business does, it's how you behave and how you respond to that. It's the impact on you and it's the impact on your staff and volunteers and partners and sometimes it's the impact on your rent and mortgage payments. So yes, it's been a tough old year. So of course we have COVID, but we also have um, the situation we're looking at in terms of the natural environment and climate change. I want to point us to here to what Greta Thunberg said at the 2019 UN Climate Action Summit in New York, when she said at the bottom of that paragraph there, she said, we are in the beginning of a mass extinction and all you can talk about is money and fairy tales of eternal economic growth. How dare you? Now the point of that is to is to remind us that in actual fact there is a new emerging landscape of business and activity that is coming through these multiple crises. I want you to hold on to that. And of course, we're seeing with Extinction Rebellion and that level of appetite for change with people on the street, that there is a growing awareness that that old paradigm of how business was constructed and run and delivered and impacted is now fading and crumbling. Its validity is being undermined, my goodness, at long last, because we've started to understand that business as usual is actually killing us. We've said for a long time, it wasn't the best way of doing things. And now we've got to a stage where we're saying, no, no, it's more than that. It's causing us unimaginable problems. And what we're starting to see now with those, are those tipping points and change socially, economically, financially, structurally, whether it's to do with what Greta's doing, whether it's to do with an understanding that business has to be about behaving fairly 
about making sure we don't leave anybody behind, about making sure we collaborate with others. And again, we can see that on the street with people coming forward and in our legislators, where people have started to say, we need to take note of these situations, whether it's about creating new economic models, which I'll come to on in a moment, or climate emergency declarations. There is more change that's been happening, just as that graph showed over the last 12 months than I remember seeing in a long time. And I'm a big fan of change and I've been dancing around trying to make it happen for a long time with a lot of the people in this room. But we're seeing it happening at an unprecedented rate now. So given that we've got those crises and that emerging landscape, what are the solutions that we need? And I think if we are assuming that the business as usual is not an option, especially at the moment with those extra crises happening, then maybe we're thinking about the different things that we need to move us along. And my hard won experience, and I suppose I have the triumphs and the bruises of working in this enterprise, in this sector. I wouldn't want to work in any other, by the way. Um, they have taught me that what we are looking for, what we are desperate for now is galactic levels of collaboration, of communication, of the ability to rule break and think critically about the models that we're in, about the waters that we're swimming, about how we think together in systems, how we understand what we're doing in terms of systems thinking, about how we operate as a system, as an ecology of social entrepreneurs. And then as part of that, deliver that culture of contagious change to add to the weight that we're seeing. So a lot of that, the, the change that we're seeing can be quite scary, but in actual fact, it's giving us that critical juncture. We think, okay, well, this might be the opportunity that we've been waiting for where we can deliver even more better change because suddenly everything is in the air. So these are the things that we're looking at now. And my learning over the last three decades is not only is this what we need, these are five of, the, five of the things that distinguish and define what a social entrepreneur is, what the social enterprise sector is. These are our secret weapons, our magic tools, our strengths, because I suspect that all of you deploy some or all of these at some point, probably every day. And what I'm thinking is we need to turn the volume up on all of these. So let's have a little look at them. Given that's the situation and given these are our strengths, this is exactly the moment when social entrepreneurship can move forward because we behave differently, we operate differently, we think differently, we determine a trajectory and an objective differently. So let's have a little look at that sense of um, collaboration. It's about the importance of collaborating with determination and purpose and understanding that's what we do at our heart. You think of emperor penguins, these beasts operate in the most extraordinary adverse circumstances and the way that they survive is that they huddle and when the penguin on the outside gets very very cold they bring him onto the inside and a penguin from the inside takes the outside space that's actually what they do to survive they don't do it individually they do it as a group and that's how the whole huddle of pe penguins survive they make sure they understand that if they haven't got each other they will all freeze to death and my thinking has always been if penguins can do this why on earth can't we as economists and entrepreneurs or as business people or as a species uh, take a lesson from our feathered friends? Because they understand this is about complex, not linear, whole system, not selective and individual systems. The second thing that is required and that we do is the notion of communicating, moving around and communicating, whether it's to skills um, or assets or systems or information or ways of being. We move it around our system without even thinking about it. We need to do that twice as well now. This is something that moves that ecology of social entrepreneurs head and shoulders above some of the other businesses where they are hell bent on competition. And we understand at a very deep level, the importance of collaboration. If you look at what's happening now, some of the smaller businesses that aren't even, wouldn't even describe themselves as social entrepreneurs or CRCs per se, but essentially operating in the same space, they're coming together now because they understand this big change that we're looking for, this huge change where we tackle planetary health and human health and ecological and climate breakdown and economic uncertainty. None of this is going to happen if we do it individually. It has to be done collaboratively. So WeShare is a platform for professionals, an ecosystem. It's emerging and it brings together organisations so that the people are safe, the individual business is safe and the network is safe in terms of what they're doing. And this is how I see the schools for social entrepreneurs. And this is how I see the families of social entrepreneurs that, that are happening across the UK and across the world. Thirdly, we really need to challenge some of these old stories. Otherwise, we are literally following each other off the cliff. 
So those stories about economic growth, those stories about we take from our, um, our feedstock of people and we take from our natural environment and we convert it into stuff and we get people to buy it and then we create a waste problem for somebody else to deal with. That is an old dead narrative that belongs to the last century. We have a very, very different narrative. So understand that narrative, understand those stories, challenge where you think it's not right. This goes back to what Sally was saying about demanding change and modeling it, not just giving somebody else a hard time for doing it wrong in our view, but saying, well, this is how I'm doing it, provide an alternative and never ask for permission to do stuff better. We're very good at just doing stuff better. Imagine if we waited permission to somebody say, oh, yes, it's OK to do things better than they were to be a social entrepreneur. None of us would have ever started. Because now is that time for that courageous ability to see where we think the rules are working and say, no, that isn't working. I'm going to do something different and I'm not going to ask anybody's permission, but I'm going to change the rules to make them better. We know that across the waves of time, we've seen that change happens when people have done that. When, as the quotation says, the most innovative designers consciously reject the standard option box and they cultivate it's growing, they cultivate an appetite, a hunger for thinking wrong, for doing things differently. I bet every one of you at some point has been in a room or a funding bid or a situation where you feel you're the only person talking your language. Probably means you're heading in the right direction. So hold on to that, because otherwise we're just following the grey suits off. When in actual fact, what we want to be doing and what we're really good at doing, even though we might not have named it as that, is critical thinking. What happens now? What is required now? What do I need to do? Some of the things I saw in the chat of the businesses that people are setting up are absolutely thinking about what is required. Not what can I sell and how can I grow, but what is required on a social and environmental basis? And how can I construct a business that will meet that need and make stuff better? This is the heart of what we do. Fourthly, we don't think in straight lines. Please continue never to think in straight lines. We have divergent thinking and creativity at the heart of what we do. We are super agile. Small is difficult, but small is agile and agile is creative. We don't think in straight lines. We think collaboratively. We see lots of possible answers to a question, which means we have so many advantages over the big institutional corporate beast that can't turn around. We can literally pivot and pirouette in a moment if we think that we need to change what we're doing or respond to circumstance. We are essentially system thinkers. Have a look at these things and see if any of them resonates with you. We don't think just in parts and how we can extract the best. We think in holes. We don't think in straight lines. We think in how the whole thing connects. We don't just see individual parts. We see how it comes together and gives us a whole picture. We're bored of just looking at structures. We think in processes and how we can communicate with each other and communicate with our partners and communicate with other collaborators in our communities. We don't think in hierarchies, we think in networks networked and distributed leadership and we certainly don't, don't get stuck on one object because our interest is in the relationship between the objects that might be the different things that we provide the goods or the services the people that we work with our relationship to each other our relationship to the people that are in out inside our, our enterprise our relationship to the natural world we think naturally like that and even though it's been very hard to date to do that there's been a bit in your belly that said this is the right thing to do what we see now is that emerging context where suddenly that is being heard. So this is what we need to play to our strengths. And I would say we're living in very, very unreasonable times at the moment. And we are way past the moment where we had to be reasonable and well behaved. And to the many women, also to the men, but to the many women who head up social enterprises, we should always remember that well behaved women have rarely made history. And it's not just about making the history now. We're tasked with making a new future. Because this is where the change happens right now, on our watch, today, this week, this year and this decade, we have a lot to do. And if you look around us, in terms of that emerging landscape, that new alternative architecture that's coming forward that we can engage with, there are lots of different organisations and initiatives that are saying we need to think differently. There's this outfit called 80,000 Hours that is talking to people inside ordinary corporate organisations saying you've got 80,000 hours in your career, how can you best use them to help solve the world's most pressing problems? You are already doing that inside this sector. You are already there. Look at what Rob Hopkins is saying in his in his uh, blog. The last the, One of the last episodes, episode nine, is talking to Catherine Trebek. What if we lived in a well-being economy? Everything you do as a social entrepreneur is moving towards an economy based on well-being, well-being of people and well-being of our planet. Look at what the New Economics Foundation is saying. We work with people igniting change from below. 
and we carry out rigorous research to fight for change at the top. They're talking about changing the rules to make the economy work for everyone. It's what you're doing. The Wellbeing Economy Alliance is talking about collaborations, organisations, alliances, working towards a wellbeing economy delivering human and ecological wellbeing. They could be talking about a social entrepreneur. And of course, it's happening even in our universities now with, with students across the world demanding that they are taught economics differently from their tutors. And of course, donor economics, the donor economics action lab now, where that has examples of donor economics and how people are putting it to practice from across the world. It's an international platform, donoreconomics.org. I would say to you, in terms of that notion of being a social entrepreneur has social and environmental objectives, but it's not just about where we're headed, it's who we are, it's how we operate. We operate socially. We operate socially in terms of looking after our staff. We operate socially in terms of who we collaborate with. And I would suggest to you now, if you have not engaged with these bigger networks that are crying out for examples of well-being economy um, and donor economics and new economics foundation uh, premises on how we consider building a future with better economy, approach them now. We have local authorities and organizations everywhere trying to grasp the donut. You are exactly what is, what is required in terms of a new economic model. I know this is happening across the UK, it's happening in Scotland. If you are anywhere there or across the world, approach the people who are thinking about donuts and saying, I'm a social enterprise, I deliver social benefit and environmental benefit, it's how I run my business. They will bite your hand off. So if we're talking about levering big change and we consider ourselves as Archimedes, um, the, the, the ability to leave a massive change from relatively small, limit. this is exactly what you are as a social enterprise. It's what we do. And I would say, never under, underestimate the impact that you're having, because it's not just your business. It's never just your business. It's your business and your role in that wider ecology and the impact you are having on those around you. I know, for example, my kids follow what I do. I know it has an impact on what they think and how they think the world should behave, all of the people who surround you, your friends and your family and your collaborators will be inspired by the way you're running your business. And we shouldn't forget that. So as Einstein says, and he knew a thing or two, setting an example is not the main way of influencing others. It is the only means of doing so. So fifth and finally, we make change contagious by what we do, how we talk about it, how we model these different intentions. So to sum up, remember, these are the things that we need. And these are the things that we are that define as a social entrepreneurs. We communicate by nature. Make sure you're doing that everything you do internally and externally. We don't think in straight lines. Never allow yourself to think in straight lines. Think about how what you're doing is connected to somebody else and um, how, how different ideas inside your own enterprise might be connected, how you can collaborate with maybe surprising people who aren't even a social enterprise. Think differently, think collaboratively, think horizontally and not um, hierarchically. Remember the penguins, we are very good at looking after each other. This is something that's coming forward now. In lots of leadership programs, they're talking about empathy, they're talking about compassion, they're talking about emotional intelligence. This is a, the boots you put on every day are made of this. We challenge the narrative and sometimes it's really hard. It's really, really hard. A long time ago, I was told categorically, we wouldn't get any support for what we were trying to do because quote, Environmental input does not equal economic output. And that phrase seared itself into my brain. And I thought, right, in that case, sod you, I'm going to do it anyway. It's what we do as social entrepreneurs. And we make change contagious. And we have an opportunity now with this alternate emerging landscape, this new alternative architecture to say, we have been doing this for a long time. This is how we think, this is how we behave, this is how we connect. This is your opportunity. This is our opportunity to move into that space where the bigger systems are crying out for different, better ways of doing things. So I would say one of the most important things that somebody, that one of my directors said to me a long time ago was when things were quite tricky. He said, some days are just like this. And I thought, yes, you're right, actually. And it reminded me that not all days are when we're having a tricky time. And then he said, be careful, but not too careful. And I think that I could probably have that written on my wall in every room I've ever worked in, because if we are too careful, we don't take risks and we know where the good risks are. Being a social entrepreneur is risky, but we know that in actual fact, we're heading in a direction that means something environmentally and socially and economically. So our big question now, what we're going to have a little look at is how do we play to those strengths? How do we look at these five issues and make sure that we can find a way of moving forward, playing to them? So I would say to sum up, 
we are in times of massive and ongoing change and that isn't going to stop. It, there is an argument to say that change will continue. We need to figure out how to ride it. We need to make change a good place to be. So I say thank you very much indeed. Thank you for listening.